Well, Pastor Luke, here we are back again, following our time together. And uh, last week was awesome, talking with everybody, hearing the stories about just kind of reading that first week. Now uh, we have read uh, through week two, which takes us through a significant uh, time period. Uh, so if you feel like week two has this, there's just a lot going on, it's because there's a lot going on and there's a time period. So you went from you know, the conquest era last week, we start this week with judges through the prophetic books. And so uh, I'm hoping you're still excited. I'm hoping actually that you started to feel some momentum building. You're seeing the arc. We'll talk a little bit about the arc. We're seeing the arc kind of get filled out. We're kind of roughly two thirds of the way through the arc. The maps have changed a little bit. That's been kind of fun to see how those have happened. So I, I've been excited. I've been through this a lot of times, and it's fun to be going through it again uh, together. But I know we talked to judges and the kingdom era, the exile era. I know for you, uh, Pastor Luke, that time of kind of the kingdom and how it divides, you really like that. So tell us a little bit about kind of what's going on there and maybe what the book doesn't talk about quite as much. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's so much that we could talk about in this, and we could turn this into a four and a half hour thing per <laughs> section. I mean, uh, it's so much fun. And uh, Pastor Bill is absolutely right. The The kingdom era is something that I want for us to kind of dial in a little bit. Uh, if you look in the kingdom era section on page 79, um, you'll see the heading number two, it says divided kingdom, a civil war. Um, I almost would argue that for this this chapter, rather than just calling it the kingdom era, the divided kingdom era might be an even better way of describing it. Because truthfully, the kingdom spends more time divided, divided. than it does unified. It only makes it a couple of generations as right. a united kingdom, and then it divides right then. And this idea of the northern and the southern kingdom is going to be very important, particularly as we move into the prophetical books towards the end of the readings for this week. Um, we're going to be like, you, you have this Jerusalem and then you have this Samaria. And what, what you may not understand is that these are two kingdoms that are just a few miles apart for each other, but they've got different Kings leading them. And the prophets are going to be writing to the, the leaders of these two kingdoms. Right. And what we're actually going to see as the Bible opens up is that the Northern kingdom is going to be, uh, exiled. You kind of see that we had, we got to that exile part. The northern kingdom is going to be exiled a couple hundred years before the southern kingdom, and we're never going to hear from the northern kingdom again. Okay, it's just gone, just gone. Yeah. And the southern kingdom, where Jerusalem is based out of, this is the people that's going to end up being able to come back during the exile era. So when we have the kingdom era, that's partially true, but it really is a divided kingdom, and the northern kingdom is going to be gone, never heard from again. Southern kingdom is actually going to be restored as a remnant, and you're going to see this theme that goes throughout the Bible <coughs> excuse me, of about God always provides himself a remnant, and he always calls his people back. But for 10 of the tribes of the people of Israel, that's not true. They're just gone, and we never hear from them again. And the southern kingdom is the one. So in your book or in your notes, you almost might want to add, when you see the kingdom era, any time there, put the divided kingdom era. Because um, I think that, that that might be helpful to think about. Um, so with that understanding that you've got this divided kingdom with a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Every chapter after that, whether it be the, the exile period or the return period, this divided kingdom thing is going to be kind of pronounced. Now, Pastor Bill, when we, you and I were talking in preparation for this, you mentioned that the poetical books really had something that of interest there for you. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, and this is helpful because in, in a Western culture, when we talk about either poetry or even historical or prophetic a Western mind, as far as poetry, loves rhyme. We are built on words that rhyme. Hebrew, po Hebrew poetry has no interest in rhyme, and it has a, it's much more interested, if you look on page 112, you'll start to see the different forms of how it works. They, they love parallelism, and this you'll see in those things that says, God is awesome and great. We love our God. God is awesome and great. You'll see this parallelism that's always happening. Or you'll see on the review on page 113 that some things are 
are complementary, some things are contrasting. So it's very, very different. And if you look on page 115, you can see kind of some of the, the, the poetic books listed there. Most people don't realize the book of Job is a, is a, is a generally considered a poetic book, Psalms, uh, poetic, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. So as you read them, you've got to remember that they're not historical books. And even in Hebrew narrative, when they talk about history in Western world, we love dates. Everybody remembers from history class, you got to memorize your dates. They don't care about dates in Hebrew history. They care about people and the movement of people and the story of the characters. So even as you read in, in your Bible, as you read some of the historical books, you're not going to see dates. You'll see references to kings and things like that. So I really like looking at the different uh, uses of Hebrew uh, poetry. And if you look on page 116, you'll see uh, Psalms are for praise. Proverbs are for some wisdom. Ecclesiastes kind of talking about life and what life is really like. And then Song of Solomon, this love story. So, so much going on in the poetry world uh, as far as the our, our Bible is concerned. And one of the um, things, I one of the things, Bill, would. one of the things, Pastor Bill, that you've talked about a lot is that, and this is even finding its way into our vision and mission as a church, is that we worship God not with our minds only, but with right. our heart and our emotion. Can you talk a little bit about that? I've always loved when you talk about that. Well, it's fascinating to me how much of uh, Hebrew story and poetry, we have a book called the Book of Lamentations, the the lament of the heart, the darkness in, in a culture that things like depression and anxiety, those are out there, but people don't realize the Bible talks deeply about it. Job even says that famous line, it would have been better had I not been born. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful lament. And I love that our Bible has great knowledge and intellect, but I love that the poetry captures some of the, 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 the highest highs of our faith and the darkest and deepest woes where people even call out. Job says, I would argue with you, but you are so far from me. I've looked to the east and to the west, to the north and south. And which of us, who of us in the faith journey hasn't had times that God seems silent and distant? And I love that the poetry talks as much to our heart as to our mind. Absolutely. And you think about within that poetry stuff where you have in the Psalms, you have people that are experiencing the deepest parts of grief and are um, and, and are and are going before God in repentance because of their brokenness and their sin or how distant God feels. What this is, this is so um, wonderful is that God provided in his word permission for us to yeah. even question his goodness at times, to yeah. question him. He's not afraid of that. And so that's such yeah. an encouraging thing to see in the word, you know? Absolutely. And that's the emotion of the text. You know, I love when God does show up in the book of Job and he has that line. He says, all right, I'm here now. And I have some questions for you. <laughs> he has that line. He goes, gird up your loins like a man. Cause now I got questions. For you. I love that. That It's like so honest of our God to say, okay, Let's get after it. And he does it in a poetic way and not necessarily just an intellectual way. So I love the poetry side of what we see in our Bible. Absolutely. So if you guys move forward in your book into the prophetical book section, um, there's something that I really want to call out to your attention. If you look at page 122, you remember we talk about the divided kingdoms. So you've got the northern kingdom. You've got the southern kingdom. If you look at this grid at the bottom of page 122, you see the structure of the prophetical books you have to Israel. Okay. So that's referring to the Northern kingdom. There were two prophets that were sent before the exile to the Northern kingdom, but you'll notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that were sent to Judah. All right. But here's the interesting thing. There's also two prophetic books to Assyria, a kingdom that's not what we would think of as being like part of the people of Israel. There's one to Edom, which is sort of like a cousin of the Hebrew people. This is Esau's descendants. You had the patriarchs. You had Jacob and Esau. This is mm -hmm. Jacob's brother, Esau, his people. All right. 
And then during the exile, you have the prophecy from Ezekiel and Daniel and the post-exile. So after their return, you have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And what this beautiful picture is, is that God sends us his word before we're in trouble, while we're in trouble, in trouble. and while he's restoring us from trouble. <laughs> and it's so cool the way that he he's with us the entire time. Um and I also wanted to point out this difference in number three and four on page 123, the difference between foretelling and forth telling. Okay. Right now, we would even argue that when you come to church on Sunday or you listen to a sermon on a podcast or whatever, this is another example of forth telling. It's proclaiming the teachings of God. God has given us his word and we have that in confidence. But when a lot of people think about the term prophecy, they only think about the predicting the future part. And what you'll notice, I think the author gets it right here. He says uh, uh, in the kind of the third line down, he says, rather, this information was given to him by God. Um, it's a very minor amount of the text is prophecy in terms of looking forward in the future. And almost all of it is what should we do with what's been revealed already by God today? And so much today, you know, there's a movement within Christianity about, it's all about what's going to happen in the future, the future, the future, the future. But what we see through the biblical text is that God holds the future in his hands. And it's almost like the admonition for us here is keep your eyes in your own homework mm -hmm. here, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, keep yeah. Your eyes don't, in your get, own don't homework get carried here. away. <laughs> don't get too far down the road for sure. You know? Yeah, so, that is so true. So we wanted to call that out to you. Now, there are a couple of things that we haven't went into in great detail here. Um, one I just wanted to briefly mention to you, Pastor Bill, and wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about is this, this silence period. So we have these big chunks of, of time, right? You've got the judges, 400 years. Then you've got several hundred years of kingdom. Then you've got this very brief 70-year period of exile they come back, they get restored over a couple of decades, and then there are several hundred years where God doesn't say anything. What do we do with that? Yeah, that's such an interesting period of time because, you know, our Bible, we the Old Testament ends and the New Testament starts, and it's usually one page apart or maybe a little divider there, yet there's this huge uh, block of time. And historically, there is actually quite a bit going on, obviously, in that time period. But uh, and then we open up, as we know, the New Testament with Israel uh, under Roman rule, and they kind of are still in their land, and they've got uh, Jesus is born, and we know that there's a, a King Herod there. So there's a ton that happens in in Jewish history that's not in necessarily in our Bible. But the point is, even though history is happening, God for that time has chosen to be silent. And God doesn't say why. God doesn't tell us. We, we actually have a similar line back when Samuel appears. God says, mm -hmm. I've chosen to be quiet. I only speak once in a while in a dream. I've chosen not to speak at this time. So it's interesting that between our Bibles, our Old and New Testament, there's this silence era that there's really nothing that God has had us record. And then Jesus shows up on the scene in the synoptic gospels. So that's where if you look on page 102, you'll see the nations that are changing and Alexander the Great, and you'll see the Maccabeans, a powerful group in the Jewish history, the Pharisees come out, uh, and there's a hope of a Messiah, Savior out there, but nothing has happened yet. So it's a strange period of time, but a lot's going on, but not, not anything necessarily in the middle of our Bible. And it's interesting too, when you see this this movement. So this is the first time where the, the Jewish people get really serious about trying to be faithful to the law. And it's out of this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come, but isn't it just like us that God's quiet and we start talking a lot? <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. You know, because so the, 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 the thing says that the people get entombed in legalism. They get entombed, yeah. like, well, God's not saying anything. So we better fill the silence right. with a whole bunch of new rules and ideas. <laughs> isn't that just yeah. like us? <laughs> totally. That is totally true. I, I agree that we do. We add way too much when we should just be quiet, do what he told us to do. That's it. And one sort of kind of last thing I wanted to point out when we had our discussion as a group in the in-person version of this last week, one of our one of our contestants said, you know, for the for the judges section, how is it that we get Samson as the Samson. primary cans character and yeah. not Samuel? Samuel? And that's something that right. you, you could for sure could go back and Samuel is like 
there, there's this motif that goes through scripture of a gentleman or a man or a woman who's the prophet, mm-hmm. priest, and king. Incorrect. Like they tell the word of God. They serve on God's behalf as a mediator between God and man, and they have the authority. And Samuel is a guy there that gets it about as close as anybody we've right. seen be able to get it right. Same. So should he be the pr- the principal guy for for judges? What do you think, Bill? Uh, I I really do. I, I mean, I like Samson a lot. As I've studied Samson, I kind of went from one of those ones that saw all that he did wrong and and kind of have turned to see his redemptive value in the story of Israel. But it's hard to beat Samuel as almost the consummate perfect Bible character. I mean, I don't think anybody uh, can really compare to him in so many ways, his faithfulness and well, it's his like, life, how he's gone. I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of a baseball guy, right? Like, like Samuel's like Hank Aaron, like first ballot hall of famer. And then maybe Samson's Pete Rose, like, you know, yeah, he's right. probably more <laughs> famous than Hank Aaron. Should he be in the hall of fame? Probably so. Cause he's so noted. Right. He has so much notoriety, but he's a good guy. Wow. Well, we don't know. Yeah, like, you yeah know. <laughs> totally. That's totally true. But I, I love the Samson character. Uh, I know it's not a, a Samuel character. So I'm sorry. And my, one of my favorite Samuel character stories is, you know, is here he is the priest. He's supposed to be and everybody think he's just Mr. Nicey, nicey. When Saul doesn't kill the king that he was supposed to. And uh, uh, Samuel shows up and like goes, hey, what's that guy? And, and it even says that the king thought, hey, man, like they're going to let me live, you know. And it's fascinating. Samuel pulls out his sword and kills the guy following God's decree. It's a people don't often look at, at him that way. But he was like you said, he was prophet, priest, king. He fulfilled all the roles. He's a powerful Jesus like character and does so many things so, so, so well. Mm-hmm. So that's that's most of the things that we want to talk about. Did you have any other kind of last remarks you wanted to make about this week or? No, I just think as we kind of look to next week, you know, keep in mind, we're going to start talking about a little bit of the geography of the New Testament. We're going to want to kind of get our mind around how that's working. We're going to be talking about the gospel era, the church era, uh, kind of missions, how the church expands and then the epistles. And then right at the end of next week, you're going to start to get into some of the doctrines. So kind of be ready for that shift as we do the arc. We're going to fill out those last, that last third, and then we're going to be moving into these doctrines next this week's reading. That's what you'll be feeling, that shift of going from the Bible to doctrine. Absolutely. And so if you're kind of participating in the online version of this, one of the things that we would be hoping that you'd be able to do by this point is if you sat down with a napkin and a pen, that you'd be able to draw out the arc of scripture. And for the first seven that you have, you'd be able to draw that little icon there and be able to describe what those what those are. Because remember, this isn't just meant to be something that you keep up in your head. This is meant to be that you're going off for coffee with somebody that's new to faith, and they're like, I don't understand what this Bible thing's about. And you're like, well, let me show you. And you just kind of can draw it out mm-hmm. for them. We're trying to provide these as tools for you. You could draw your little map of the Mediterranean, maybe, and you got, oh, yeah, here's Jerusalem down the south end here, and here's the Dead Sea, and they're crossing back over this Jordan River back and forth. That's what we'd be hoping you'd be able to do. So if you're participating in the online version of this, Maybe just take out a pen and a, and a napkin and see if you can draw out yeah. some of this Bible arc thing. Okay, so that's our encouragement to you. Um, but in any case, thank you so much for participating in this, and we will see you next week. See ya.